um, my name is Susan Kahlo, and I am with the going to be conducting this interview for the Library of Congress for their Veterans History Project in Washington D.C. Today's date is Tuesday, April eighteenth, two thousand twenty-three. And we are in Marietta, Georgia, and I am with Anthony Gasper. So um, after, I, it's always, this is always the most fun part for me, is after I get to meet with people, and then when we finally sit down to push the record button, um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's good. So um, this will be just to relax and have a comfortable conversation. But uh, to set the record, could you please give your name and spell your name? Yeah. My name is Anthony Lester Gasper. Last name is spelled G-A-S-P-E-R. Okay. And can you give um, uh, your branch of service that you're in and rank? Yeah, I was a captain in the United States Marine Corps. Okay. And, um, and then where's your hometown? Hometown originally is uh, Cedar Grove, Wisconsin. Okay. I was born in uh, St. Alphonsus Hospital in Port Washington, Wisconsin, uh, which is about 10 miles south of where my folks lived and where I grew up. Okay. And I was born in 1946 in June. Okay, great. All righty. Well, starting with there, just in Wisconsin, how did you grow up? Where were you and kind of work did your parents do or were they, were they also in the military? Um, what was going on in your life when you were, before you joined? Uh, my mom and dad owned a dairy farm in Cedar Grove, Wisconsin. Um, that's what my dad's life was, I guess, till he turned in his 50s and realized that farming wasn't earning him much income. Mm -hmm. So uh, grew up there. Um, mom was a homemaker, and uh, I have five sisters and three brothers. Where so are you? We, well, five sisters and three brothers. Where are you in that line? I'm the oldest boy to second child of the family. Okay. Did you work on the dairy farm? Just curious. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's what kids on dairy farms do. <laughs> mm -hmm. do, you, do you know how many cows you had? Uh, Dad's uh, barn held a, uh, enough stanchions and stations for 30 uh -huh. dairy cows. It was a, a dairy farm, uh, you know, family farm at that time. He had about 200 acres of land. And then did he sell locally, or was did he sell to a commercial, to another uh, Originally to the local cheese factory, which was uh, on the corner of Dad's property, uh -huh. <laughs> and later to the Borden's company. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah, so that's... Uh, with. I, I hadn't thought of that with the Wisconsin, of course, cheese. Yeah. Probably had a lot of Dutch people there, too, in, yeah. in the area. Well, the... Uh, Cedar Grove um, is Dutch Reformed Church, basically. Mm -hmm. Most of the people, uh, a lot of them came uh, a shipwreck that occurred in Lake Michigan of immigrants. So there's a, a, a group of them there. And uh, um, when I say Dutch Reformed Church, because it was a pretty, pretty strict, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no working on Sundays. Uh, if you're a farmer, you had to milk cows and everything like that, but you didn't putz in the garden or anything like that. Uh, we were just far enough west, while well, we had a Cedar Grove address, we were in the uh, Luxembourg, uh, German area to, of the state. So uh, folks' background is Luxembourg and Germany. Okay, all right. Were, so were you in high school to what... There, when your dad had the farm, were you also like doing high school and going during home? high school? Uh, we were actually in the Randolph High School school district, so uh, uh, the border line on my dad's the fence line to my dad's east was the border line between uh, Cedar Grove High School and Random Lake High School. So uh, we went to Random Lake High School, and uh, uh, that was mostly again Dutch. Uh, uh, Luxembourg German background of hmm. uh, the people. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that about that part. Well, well, lead me up to what. So you're in high school. When did you join the? What was the transition? Um, I was a. I had noticed it before that, but uh, as a junior in high school, I realized and saw a number of uh, seniors uh, 
who had joined the Naval Reserve, and they mm -hmm. went to meetings once a week. And um, I was thinking that college was probably not a, a financial option for me at that mm -hmm. point in time, coming from a large family and that. So I thought that was a way I could go in the Naval Reserve, spend two years active duty, uh, save some money, and then possibly go to college after getting out of the Naval Reserve. So I, I joined the Naval Reserve in July of 63 between my junior and senior year. I had just turned 17. My parents signed the papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I joined the Was that nearby so, then? So was it near? I uh, went up to Sheboygan. Uh, okay. At that point in time, they had what the Navy called the Corn Belt Fleet. There were, I believe, five ships, Navy ships, on the uh, on the Great Lakes, and one of them was stationed in Sheboygan. And there was a Naval Reserve Center there, and the USS Ely, I believe it was, mm -hmm. was stationed there. So uh, the Corn Belt Fleet. Okay. So. When you went, when you joined in with the reserves, and so when you, from the time that you, that you, I guess, signed? Yeah. Then when did you actually, like, did you go to a boot camp? Did you, what, what was the process? Uh, I Training. signed in July, and in August I went to a Navy Reserve boot camp uh, in Rhode Island. Mm. Um, two weeks long, um, nothing overly strenuous, uh, and then... Throughout the uh, senior year in high school, went to reserve meetings on Monday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, spent a couple hours uh, at the reserve center and uh, earned a few dollars. Did you Not like much. it? What were your impressions? Like, is it? Can you remember how you felt about? It was a new experience. Very interesting. I was meeting people. I was learning things. Uh, mm -hmm. um, seeing the world a little bit different. Um, the recruiter at the reserve center, um, after he had got me to sign, uh, he he asked if I had ever thought about going into the Navy ROTC program. He said I had good grades and everything like that, could get a Navy ROTC. And being the suave, debonair, know-it-all person, I said the what? And he he talked about this program through uh, Navy um, to get into college where they would partially pay for my college education, and I would be commissioned an officer after, uh, after graduation. So uh, he said you had two weeks from the date he told me about it to get my application in and get a couple of uh, uh, references in and, and a couple things like that. And uh, we applied and um, got invited to take an exam and then a physical, mm -hmm. and, and uh, from that uh, went on to college through the Navy ROTC program. Did you have, was it the same recruiter you stayed in touch with at various times or were they different people? It sounds like you somebody took a little interest in you. He, he, he was my primary contact at the reserve unit. And, uh, uh, of course, being a recruiter, you know, he maintained a relationship with all the people that he recruited and he followed up with them and everything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Trying to find out if he did a good job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember his name, do you, by chance? No, I do not. Oh, okay, I'm just curious. Sometimes yeah. they make an impression. Yeah. So you went on. So you took that route. Yeah, I took that route, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember applying, but I got accepted at Marquette University, and uh, then in uh, September of '64, uh, that would have been. I graduated in June. In September of '64, I started at Marquette University. Were you the only one now in your family, though, that took off? Was everybody else left back on the farm? Uh, at that point in time, um, yeah, I was the only one that really had... Uh, Ruth had gone to college for a year and then, and then came back home. Uh, she's a year older than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I was the first one that uh, fled the Latin nest, more or less. And I, you know... I had the best parents in the world, so uh, fleeing doesn't sound like the right term. Okay, but, that's uh, fair. Good. <laughs> yeah. So where? So now you're. So where did you go from there? Well, Marquette University. Um, the program was four mm -hmm. years. Uh, I wasn't the best of students, uh, so it took me uh, four and a half years. I made the dean's list a couple of times. Um, not the 
one for good grades. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shape up or ship out okay. this. Well, yeah. But uh, as part of Navy uh, ROTC, you did uh, three summer tour, uh, active duty sessions. Uh, uh, the first summer we went on an aircraft carrier mm -hmm. and uh, spent some time with a... Uh, Navy P-2 uh, patrol squadron out of Bangor, Maine, and then uh, the USS Essex, which was one of the oldest aircraft carriers in the Navy at the time, out of Rhode Island. Uh, it was about six, seven weeks we did that. And the second summer, I actually took uh, summer school that year and, and uh, deferred uh, that cruise, as we called it. Then the third summer, between junior and senior year, uh, we did three weeks aviation, orientation, which mm -hmm. we did at uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, mm -hmm. and then three weeks at Little Creek, Virginia with the Amphibious Navy. And then I went from there, I left, went up to Quantico, Virginia, the Marine Corps Education and Development Command. It's actually Development and Edu Education Command mm -hmm. uh, for Officer Candidate School. So that was six weeks. Well, wow. so just to wind back a little bit, when you, the first time you went on an aircraft carrier, I mean, do you remember that? I mean, you're going from a farm, Wisconsin, flat, now you're out on an air... Do you remember that? Do you remember... It was like being a big in a big building with the river flowing by. You didn't feel much... We didn't hit any bad weather, so you didn't feel oh, much okay. ship movement or anything like that. Okay. So, uh... And then, and then had you been, when you went to Rhode Island and when you went for your training, had you been out of state before from Wisconsin? Uh, or were these... First time. Illinois. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and one of the other things with Naval Reserve, uh, um, I did go out for two weeks on the another one of the Corn Belt Fleet ships, the Daniel A. Joy, out of uh, outer Chicago. We spent two weeks floating around on uh, uh, Lake Michigan, uh, kind of learning what the... Uh, what the Navy enlisted people do. So you got exposed to that. Did you have, were you assigned duties on the ship? I mean, were, did you feel, I mean, were you doing new things or were you using kind of skills you had? Or? Oh, it was, everything was new. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, working in an engine room or working in a uh, uh, combat information center, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a movie with the Navy Combat Information Center and they got the big plexiglass, I'm, I would be the guy behind the plexiglass writing backwards. Oh, okay. So, uh, targets and stuff like that. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, then when in the Naval Reserve, in the ROTC, the first summer, you're supposed to learn kind of what an enlisted man does. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we did everything from chipping paint to, again, working in the Combat Information Center boiler room, standing watches and stuff like that, uh, helm, like an enlisted man would do. Mm -hmm. uh, the second summer was more orientation to aviation and amphibious warfare, Navy, Gator Navy, uh, Brown Water Navy, whatever you want to call them. And then uh, uh, for the third cruise, uh, the Navy people went aboard ship and served as junior officers, and the Marines Officer candidates went to officer candidate school. So what year was this now? Uh, that would have been in 1968. So what was your awareness of what was going on as far as conflicts in other parts of the world? Was that didn't didn't hear too much about it other than we knew something was going on in Southeast Asia, but didn't feel hmm. much connection with it. Okay. Uh, we knew that. Our Marine officer instructors, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Howard and, and uh, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Richards, had both served in Vietnam, uh, but we really didn't hear too much about about that. Uh, you know, one of the uh, junior classmates' uh, father was killed uh, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, a pilot with the with the Navy, but. Really didn't hear too much about that, and, and Marquette University was pretty conservative. So if there was an anti-war demonstration, or probably more Army and Navy ROTC people out looking for action, than there were protesters. So it, it was. So it's interesting, yeah. So you you really weren't as, as felt pretty isolated from it. Yeah. 
You think that was by design or just, just that you're too busy happened. getting trained? That's yeah, just how it happened. I don't. Oh, huh. interesting. Yeah. So we studied in, in Navy in the Marine Corps part of the Navy ROTC. We talked about the uh, uh, you know the history of war, the art of warfare, weapons, tactics, and stuff like that, but. Uh, not a lot around what was going on in, in Vietnam. Hmm. Okay. That's, it's interesting to hear that, that would, because you would think that it yeah. would have been like a pride to somebody looking back at it, thinking yeah. that, that would well, be... Well, Marquette was a very conservative uh -huh. environment. So, uh, you know, I remember war protests, but not really. Nothing more than a half dozen or more students that I'm aware of. <laughs> okay. All right. Then, then where did you go from there? Well, in uh, I graduated in December of 68, and then I headed down to Marine Corps Development and Education Command mm -hmm. again uh, in uh, Quantico, Virginia, for officer basic school, or for the, uh, the officer basic school, all new second lieutenants. Uh, at that time, we're spending five months uh, the basic school, learning the basics of being an officer, uh, admin tactics, uh, artillery, infantry, mm -hmm. logistics, uh, everything you supposedly needed uh, to serve as a junior officer in the Marine Corps. And a lot of that focused on uh, every Marine being a rifleman, every Marine officer was trained to be a platoon commander. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, even pilots and others at times found themselves in a situation where they might become a platoon commander. So uh, that was a lot of that training at that point in time. During during your training, were you did it cross your mind to make a career of it? What was, or were they? You know, was that kind of you were getting exposed I, to a lot of different areas? So I was. I, I, was I was thinking that a a, a career uh, there was a great career for me. I thought in. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was looking at toward that that perspective at that point in time. Uh, nothing real set in my mind at that point in time, but definitely was a was a thought. Mm, where'd you go from there? Well, um, toward the end of basic school, uh, you're handed a uh, a form to fill out. You have you three choices for your military occupational specialty and three choices of location for. Uh, for duty station, and I always, at that point, I wanted to be an infantry officer, put down infantry, and then I put down, I think, artillery and tanks or whatever. Uh, I was kind of figuring my college degree was civil engineering. They might put me in as an engineer, but uh, that's not one I listed. And I listed my career choices, I think, as Vietnam and Camp Pendleton, or I, I forget what the other career choices were, but... Uh, I got my I got my infantry designation as an uh, infantry officer and was sent to uh, uh, Camp Pendleton, uh, platoon commander uh, at that point. Uh, Camp Pendleton, I was a platoon commander with the 3rd Battalion, uh, 27th Marines, and I was part of the 5th Marine Division, which was activated during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 27th Marines had just recently come back from Vietnam. And when I say the regiment came back, um, what came back was those who hadn't had enough time in Vietnam to leave Vietnam. So, uh, uh, and a lot of those, when they came back, came back for discharge and stuff like that. So I think the company only had less than 100 of its assigned normal 200 some people. So uh, uh, we had a lot of sick, lame, lazy, uh, awaiting discharge uh, type of personnel. It was, uh, you know, there was not a lot of active training going on. It was primarily... Biding their time? Biding time and solve, helping solve personal problems. <laughs> but these were people who had been in Vietnam and were coming back? Uh, for the most finish. part, they had mm -hmm. been in Vietnam and, and uh, had come back. And uh, there were a couple that were still 17, so they couldn't go to Vietnam until they were 18. Oh, okay. So we had a couple of those. We had uh, uh, a couple of the Marines, uh, one of them had lost part of a lung in Vietnam. 
Mm. And uh, he was on hold waiting a medical discharge, which seemed to be taking forever, but uh, all he was physically capable of doing was watering the grass. Uh, mm. You know, anything more strenuous than that, anyone he watered the grass, he rested every half hour or mm. so. <laughs> Yeah, that's rough. So, uh, introduction, that was basically my introduction to uh, uh, walking through the barracks and smelling this unusual odor and instantly recognizing I'd never smelled it before, but also knew instantly that it was marijuana. Oh. So, uh, this is in the barracks? This was in the barracks. Okay. And uh, don't know where it came from. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, walking through as an officer today and smelling that, and again for me coming from a very conservative environment, yeah, you know, my first known use for somebody who's using uh, marijuana. So I assume that they just got away with it. Like, well, you just didn't ignore, know. You kind of you just. Everybody was sound asleep in their rack. Okay. So, uh, or or. Yeah. 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 Okay. Make them believe. Did you get stationed in Vietnam? Yeah, I, I, after three months at uh, um, at Camp Pendleton, then I was transferred to uh, to Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, to the First Marine Division, um, First Marine Regiment, uh, Second Battalion. Uh, at that point in time, the Third Marine Division was starting to leave Vietnam. Uh, the 1st Marine Division was primarily, uh, the 1st Regiment anyway, was protecting uh, the Da Nang Complex. So we were in the uh, operational area around the Da Nang Complex. Regimental headquarters was at Hill 55, okay. which was south southwest of uh, Da Nang. So was that impressionable, making, arriving in Vietnam? Uh, Do you remember? My first impression was after we left the airport and they put us on these trucks and nobody had a weapon and they drove through an area called Dog Patch, which was all uh, Vietnamese living in boxes and homes that they built out of cardboard boxes and pallets and stuff like that. And the street was narrow and people all over the place and I'm going to say, you know, anybody with a grenade could take out a whole bunch of us at one <laughs> time. but. Uh, mm -hmm. That was that was my first impression. Uh, other than it was going to be hot and humid, mm -hmm. <laughs> and some different odors. Yeah. I was also going to ask you. By this time, had you made friends? I mean, did what, what was were you forming friendships with other people while you were in the Marines, or were you just moving too much to maintain? Yeah, I was friendships? making friendships and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of friendships lasted as long as the assignment lasted, and then headed off in different directions and we weren't uh, uh, we weren't connected like uh, people are today with text and cell phones mm -hmm. and stuff like that so uh, any connection would have been by letters and stuff like that. You did run into people uh, different places you knew from the past or mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't walk into an officer's club someplace where you wouldn't have one degree of connection from somebody else you both knew, so... Mm -hmm. um, did you write a lot of letters? How, how, how was your correspondence with home? Probably huh. weak. So, um, when I arrived in Vietnam, the first five days we stayed at, regiment, at division headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, they told us uh, orientation training, some climate acclimation, uh, the training consisted of telling us, forget everything we learned about basic school, that this was a different war than they taught us to fight at the basic school. And um, the Marines are noted for their uh, marksmanship, but they taught us how to point and shoot versus aim. <laughs> Took us out to the range and had us practice pointing and shooting versus bringing the rifle up and actually aiming it, but uh -huh. uh, point and shoot. And, a few things like that, and after five days down to regimental headquarters at Hill 55, stayed there one very memorable night because the hooch we were in was fairly close to a, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, an 8-inch gun battery. And when they fired during the night, uh, 
the rack definitely shook. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, your first night in Vietnam, you levitated <laughs> when you heard the noise. <laughs> so that was your first time you were around that, weren't yeah. you? Live ar ar artillery. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, from the, you know, we had learned to uh, uh, do forward observer type stuff, call in artillery. We were in basic school, and I learned how to, the artillery functions. But yeah, this this first combat related experience. Were you ever scared? Not really. I just too young. Too young. Still mm -hmm. thinking I was immortal. Yeah. No, that was a... So how long were you there? Just at Hill Fifty Five one day, and then they uh, uh, send us by truck out to our uh, the battalion, which is at the uh, uh, Two Cow Combat Base, which was straight south from Marble Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of that area had been land cleared, uh, brush had been pushed away and everything like that. There was a lot of sand and stuff uh, uh, around. The, the base was just a pushed up berm around a piece of flat land. Mm -hmm. uh, stayed there, I can't remember how long, but uh, got assigned as a platoon commander with, uh, uh, with Echo Company. Uh, of the second battalion, and uh, quite an interesting experience checking in and going to battalion supply to to draw my uh, my gear. Oh, they didn't have any shoes. They didn't have any flak jackets. They didn't have uh, any of that stuff. When did the army to draw my my weapon, which was a TO weapon? Table of organization weapon was a 45 caliber pistol. They didn't have any of those, you know. And the answer in both cases was, when you get out to your company, they'll find those things for you. So uh, got out to company and found some used boots, and somewhere a 45 showed up, and uh, gear that was left behind by others. So what year was this? This was in uh, would have been. Uh, 1969, about October, November, early November. Mm -hmm. So then as a platoon commander, uh, we were primarily patrol activity, uh, patrolling during the day, ambushing at night. Uh, it was a very civilian populated area. We didn't shoot unless shot at. Uh, other than that, starting about 10 at night till whatever time in the morning, it was uh, anything that moved you could shoot at. So you uh, were in the bush? Uh, there weren't many bushes around, well, but you would call it cleared, in a bush. Cleared, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. our, yeah. ma our main enemy was booby traps. Okay. So uh, we would patrol. Uh, the company had uh, two areas of operation, and you'd spend, uh, the platoon would go out one day into one area. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the next day they would move to the second area, the third day they would be back at the home base. So we did that rotation. Uh, so we did that for, I can't remember how long. And it wasn't, it wasn't a long period of time. And then the company got moved to the Two Cow Bridge. And uh, uh, the Two Cow Bridge was the main crossing point for the river south of Da Nang. So our job was to patrol the area around the bridge and to protect the bridge. So uh, uh, we had people on the bridge all all day and night. Uh, anything come floating down the river, uh, they shot at, uh, make sure it wasn't a swimmer. And uh, uh, every five minutes during the day and three minutes at night, they threw a quarter pound of TNT or C4 in the river. Uh, Anybody swimming underwater close to the bridge at that point in time would definitely have been had their hurt put on them. So mm -hmm. uh, it was to protect the bridge. So uh, um, we we had that position, and then we patrolled the area north and south along the river. So by this time, you're getting a different perspective of Vietnam. Yeah, a very different perspective of Vietnam. Yeah. Do you remember it, or any impressions, or surprised, or or yeah. It was not the Marine Corps that I yeah. was led to believe, you know, that I, I envisioned 
the in majority of the majority of people in my platoon were uh, two-year enlistees. Uh, a lot of them were in high school graduates. Uh, uh, there were a few of them with the uh, jail or the Marine Corps, and they realized the uh, uh, Marine Corps was their choice, but they should have chosen jail. Mm -hmm. um, More low morale or low motivation. Low wasn't... motivation, and mm -hmm. uh, they were there. They were doing their job for the most part, but uh, they weren't very enthusiastic about it. They were hearing what was going on in the U.S. with the with the war protests and stuff like that. Uh, when I took over my platoon, a platoon commander was a, a sergeant with uh, about three years of service. It should have been a staff sergeant who would have had maybe 10 years of service. Mm -hmm. uh, my squad leaders were, I believe, corporals and uh, should have been sergeants. Um, you know, we were very uh, limited on leadership talent and stuff like that. So, I guess that's different because you had gone through the um, reserves and ROTC. So, as an officer, whereas, yeah. and then you come back and you're working with young Marines who are just getting their two years out of the way, right? Yeah, getting a lot of them getting their two years out of the way, and uh, uh, a lot of them failed to read their contract closely when they signed it because they were guaranteed aviation. And the contract said, on, on, upon reenlistment and the needs of the Corps. So, uh, you know, mm. weren't real happy about being there. And, and uh, really, there weren't a lot of bad guys in the area other than people going out and putting uh, booby traps out for us to, mm. to walk into. So do you think maybe it was just you happened to be a the area where you were as far as the Marines go at that time? Or was this kind of, um, do you feel like what you were experiencing was common? Since that areas? time, um, talking to fellow uh, members of my uh, basic school class, 10 miles away it was a totally different war. You know, and, and uh, um, it seemed like you know, we're uh, totally different wars in different areas that the, the division had. Yeah. So uh, some were very heavy contact with with enemy, uh, targeted by the enemy and stuff like that. The area we were in, all the bad guys wanted to do was get in close enough so they could shoot rockets or mortars into the air base. You yeah. know, our job was to keep them out. So, you know, when Bob Hope came to town for a show at Christmas, we weren't the ones watching the show. Okay. <laughs> we he, were now, out making sure the rockets show? weren't being so shot. <laughs> did he come in for a show while you were? Yeah. There? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. You were So you were doing the perimeter. You were, yeah, we were doing the perimeter. So that he could do yeah. his yeah. thing. Because um, that was yeah. a highlight for people. And then uh, after... Uh, a period of time at the bridge, not real long again. My platoon got sent out to a uh, uh, a base camp that we shared with uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, regional forces. And uh, there was their, their camp, we were in their camp. Uh, they had a, a tower and a perimeter and uh, we patrolled out of there. It was it was much closer into Da Nang. Uh, but uh, uh, that's where we spend a, a couple of, uh, about a month. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how, how did you find them, the, the, the Vietnamese? Um, very mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, some were very gung-ho, some were uh, killing time and glad they were in an area that were there wasn't heavy combat but again they were regional forces so mm -hmm. typically they in this area they weren't out facing uh, the frontline Viet Cong or uh, North Vietnamese Army. Yeah okay interesting I mean every, every person has a different depending right. where you are geographically yeah. right? Yeah interesting while we were at uh, at that outpost if you want to call it that 
woke up on Christmas morning and decided I wanted to go to church. And uh, so I, I, I mentioned to the platoon commander I wanted to go to church. Did anybody want to go into the, to the base? We were in walking distance. When I say walking distance, a combat patrol of uh, um, the Da Nang perimeter mm -hmm. in uh, the Marble Mountain side of the, the facility. So a bunch of people wanted to go in for different reasons. So we put together a combat patrol. We walked around the, through the rice paddies and got to the perimeter wire and uh, got inside. Some of the people came because they wanted to get a good meal. So they headed, headed to the cafeteria. Two of my machine gunners were along and they wanted to find an armorer who might be able to fix our machine gun. And mm -hmm. uh, me and a couple others went to church. We found a chapel and went in, laid our gear down and we hadn't showered in probably two weeks, three weeks, you know, patrolling wet. It was during the monsoons. Mm -hmm. We are filthy as all get out. <laughs> And we go to church, and these people are in the chapel looking at us because they're in pressed jungle utilities with, you know, uh, polished boots and everything like that. And I'm going, you know, there's a war on guys, but, you know, they're looking at us like we're weird. <laughs> so it was in English, or was it a Vietnamese? It was English, yeah. It was mm -hmm. uh, Navy chaplains. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the people that there had a chance to shower, yeah. whereas you obviously did yeah. not. Yeah. So, how was the food though? You mentioned you have get, going to get food up till now. Uh, most of the time we were eating uh, sea rations. Mm -hmm. uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, we had hot hot meals. When we were uh, rotating back to the Kauha combat base, we uh, could go to the mess hall. Sometimes they brought hot food out to the Tukau Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, the only hot food we had when we were at the Vietnamese was when they flew it in at, uh, there was no road, so they flew it in at, at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the rest of the time it was uh, sea rations and um, while we were at the Two Cow Bridge I went out on a patrol with uh, one of my squads and we hit a booby trap and uh, my platoon, the platoon sergeant and his radio operator got injured, got medevaced, mm. and uh, uh, both of them survived, and uh, uh, both got rotated back to the United States. Um, one for the seriousness of the injury, and the other for uh, like he had a sucking chest wound. The other guy, uh, um, yeah. But uh, then I got in a new. Uh, platoon sergeant, uh, staff sergeant with uh, like 16 years of experience, first tour of Vietnam, and uh, he was a pretty good cook. He could take four or five different types of sea rations, mix them together, and come up with a pretty good stew. Uh, but it was also something I needed because after two days he came to me and said, Lieutenant, you're trying to do my job because you haven't had anybody to do my job. You tell me what to do, it's my job to make it happen. You, you focus on the tactics and, and, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, so a great lesson and, uh, you know, uh, learned a lot that day. And uh, Where had he been? If you said he had been 16 years I don't know where he had all Germany? been at Stateside. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. uh, the other lesson he taught me was uh, we had a new guy being transferred into the platoon who had been in numerous companies in the battalion and had gotten in trouble in every one of those companies. So I was pissing and moaning about this person being sent to our our company and the, uh, uh, the staff sergeant said to me, Lieutenant, you don't even know the guy. Don't make judgments. We never had a problem with him. The staff sergeant got him squared away. He did his job, mm -hmm. and uh, hmm. uh, you know, never had a problem with him. You don't remember the name of the staff sergeant by chance, do you? I could probably find it because I got a lot of my old orders yet. But <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like that was a good. You know, there was a real contrast for where yeah. you were up till that point. Yeah, that yeah, was so. uh, might have been a different. Yeah. Um, with his experience, his yeah, experience so. combined with yours. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, 
I guess it was the end of January, um, 70. Uh, I was still out at the, uh, uh, out at the compound with the Vietnamese and I got orders to report into the uh, uh, battalion headquarters. Then I went down to the battalion headquarters. They, they handed me orders uh, for a week-long school uh, to go on at division headquarters. So I had to catch a tr uh, truck up to division headquarters and it was uh, a school on uh, uh, classified documents. And I'm going, what do I need to know about classified documents that I'm going to this school? And it was about inventorying them and tracking them and, and all the different types of classified documents, everything like that. And I was school for that week. And uh, toward the end of the school, I get a uh, new set of orders transferring me to regimental headquarters. And along with that was a packet saying I'd been promoted to first lieutenant. <laughs> so I said, there was no promotion ceremony. You know, I went to regimental headquarters, I found some bars <laughs> someplace <laughs> for first lieutenant. Uh, and I work, went to work in the regimental uh, operations office as a, a, a watch officer. Uh, watch officer's duty was uh, was a watch officer 24 hours a day. Normally three people in that job. Uh, but everything that happened in the combat information center, all the information coming in from the regiment, from the battalions mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. contacts, um, fire missions that were being fired, aircraft missions that were flying, all of that came into the Combat Information Center and uh, uh, we uh, kept track of what was going on and if need be we had to wake up the regimental operations officer or the regimental commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically it was the, the, uh, the nerve center for the, for the regiment. How did you find that? Uh, boring. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, you want to be, you're a Marine, you want to be where the action is. This isn't what, what the action is. The closest... That makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. This isn't what you... Closest yeah, I got to the action was not, one night I got a call from a major at an artillery battalion, <laughs> artillery battalion saying, I got to shoot this fire mission. And the area where I got to shoot is in a no-fly zone. You don't shoot into artillery where air, airplanes are flying. So he says, I got to shoot this mission, but there's a no-fly zone. And I go, so I go next door to the artillery people, and they say, yeah, there's a no-fly zone. And I go to the airplane, you know, the air, aircraft people. There's, no, there's none. There's no aircraft in that area. Back and forth, trying to figure out who put that no-fly zone on the... You know, and the aviation people kept insisting there was nobody in that area, so couldn't find out from division that anybody had put it there. So we, we erased it, and I told the major, shoot. And he says, what's your rent name, rank, and serial number? Something goes wrong, it's on your head. I gave it to him, and nothing, nothing happened. happened. <laughs> but, That's but, a bit uh, bizarre. But it was interesting at the time that I was uh, at the regimental uh, headquarters there, and the other part of my job was I was the uh, officer in charge of the classified documents. So once a month I got this packet of documents in from the National Security Agency or somebody like that, mm -hmm. and I had to go to the safe, open the safe, inventory the documents by serial number, put them in the safe, take out the old ones by serial number and, and have them destroyed. And uh, I don't know if we ever used them, but uh, hmm. uh, those, those ones I don't recall we used it at all. But, and the interesting part I find out later is I'm at the regimental headquarters and classmates of mine from the basic school in different battalions Several of them got killed mm -hmm. at different different times, and I was on the operations end. I never saw the names. Mm -hmm. You you get you get report of somebody being killed in a in a you know, but I never you know didn't learn the names until about the time of our uh, 50, 50 year reunion, 
Uh, really? Yeah. So, uh, oh. and I I only know one uh, one guy from my uh, basic school company who I hung around with a little bit at the basic school. Mm -hmm. uh, we had gone on a hike in the Shenandoah Valley, Shenandoah Mountains, and uh, uh, he had joined the same company I was in, uh, and he had a booby trap, like the first patrol he was on, and you know, last time I saw him he was in the Naval Hospital and uh, managed to connect with him later, well, many years later. That's good. Uh, but, uh, you know, several died, and, you know. Even though you're in the same battalion or regiment at the time, you, I didn't hear about it. It's, mm -hmm. Again, the, the interconnection that happens nowadays, we didn't, we didn't have then. Because so it had to have been where a report came through. Hmm. So you didn't get the news. Whereas, yeah, yeah now it would be pretty much instantaneous yeah. almost. Oh, that's a pity, but, you know. The other part, I said normally the operations officer was three people. It was three people, but for quite a period of time, we had to rotate one person down to the 51st Arvin Regiment as a liaison, uh, one officer and a couple of mm -hmm. radio operators because the 1st Division, primarily the 1st Marine Regiment, was operating in the same area as the... Uh, 51st Arvin Regiment, so we had to coordinate that we weren't running into each other in mm -hmm. the night, so uh, so one of us was normally down there for a, a couple of weeks, so the other two were on uh, eight, uh, 12 on, 12 off for however long it took, and then we went out, I guess there was recuperation a little bit, we actually didn't go to the field with them, but we stayed at their headquarters. Yeah. So two of you did the 24-hour Yep, on and off, on and off. Wow. <laughs> and uh, April Fool's Day 1970, it woke me up at 6 o'clock in the morning because I was supposed to go on watch, and I'm laying there saying, what's the worst thing that could happen if I don't go? They draft me and send me to Vietnam, and we get incoming rockets, four of them, oh. one long, one short, one left, one right. They hit us. We were right in the middle. All fell right outside the perimeter. Uh, nobody injured, but I decided being underground in a bunker may be a good place to be. <laughs> 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 April Fool's Day. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't have more rockets because they sure knew how to, yeah. Sure knew where we were. But they didn't, they missed. They missed. We had a number of people go to the sick bay because they ran into clothes lines or jumped into <laughs> foxholes that weren't there. Or where were you when you're doing the watch? Where exactly was your were you positioned? Underground in a bunker. I don't know how many feet of dirt was on top of us and sandbags and uh, you know headquarters was underground. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we were. Uh, I think it was Hill 327, it had different names. When we were there, it was called Camp Purdue. Uh, 327 was actually where the division headquarters was, so we looked from our, we looked from our camp uphill at division headquarters. So your offices were underground? Huh? They were, they were underground? Uh, they were on the uh, reverse slope of the hill, so anybody shooting, mm -hmm. hmm. and they, they did have overhead protection and stuff like that, but uh, you could see the, the building from the from our side. How long were you there? Is, is that when you ended that tour? Did you go back to the States? Yeah, I ended that tour in October. Mm -hmm. yeah, my year was, year was up. Normally our tour at that time was um, 13 months, uh, so I, I left at 12. Mm -hmm. um, when I got there, uh, Going over, half of the officers, lieutenants that were on our uh, flight over got stopped and uh, stayed in Okinawa. Now, mm -hmm. even though they had orders to Vietnam, they stayed in Okinawa because the need wasn't that great in Vietnam. And then after six months, there was a shift there. I was one of those that stayed the full 12 months. Mm -hmm. They were drawing down at that time, right? Yeah, they were drawing down. We. Uh, uh, 
we had one guy come in from the 26th Marines as they were leaving, and uh, uh, he came with his rifle, his his belt, uh, some of his 782 gear, uh, the clothes he had on, and that was it. That's all he had anymore. Um, I had a pair, extra pair of boots that fit him, so he got an, he got one of my pairs of boots because his toes were sticking out. Mm. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, he was his condition, the gear, and everything was in pretty humble shape when he got there. But he was one that didn't have enough time to go go home. Oh. So what happened from there? Well, in October, I left, flew back to the states. Uh, I didn't see any of the, you know, spitting on, cursing, or anything like that that a lot of people talk about. What was your flight, just to, just out of curiosity, from a commercial? Mm -hmm. uh, commercial. We first flew to Okinawa, stayed a couple days, then we flew to uh, some place in Japan, then some place in Alaska, and then down to California. Uh, it was commercial, mm -hmm. uh, chartered. Uh, you know, and then from there, from California, then uh, I seem to recall it was uh, from San Francisco International. I flew, flew home. Were you in uniform? Yes. And uh, a lot of people talked about it at that point in time. They were told not to travel in uniform. Well, uh, that's not the instruction we got. So. Uh, I uh, went home for, for leave, and I guess, other than my family, uh, for the most part, I was met, that I was in Vietnam was met with indifference. Mm. Oh, we haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? In Vietnam. Oh, okay. Hmm. No questions about the experience. No, thank you. No, no being cussed at, no being spit on or again. But again, that part of the... The world was uh, of Wisconsin was very conservative. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. and then how much time did you have home? Thirty days. I had about thirty days. Mm -hmm. And after that, then I uh, was uh, transferred back to Marine Corps uh, Education. I'll say that backwards. Development and Education Command mm -hmm. uh, at Quantico, Virginia, assigned to Officer Candidate School. And at Officers Candidate School, I was a I served as a platoon commander, were officer candidates, as an instructor, uh, chief tactics instructor for a while. Uh, while I was there, the, uh, uh, the Marine Corps established a staff NCO, non-commissioned officers academy, mm -hmm. and I was on the, uh, I guess what you call a plank holder, one of the original members of that organization. So they started bringing in staff NCOs for uh, for training, I seem to recall they were there like a month, something like that. But uh, again, uh, platoon commander working with the officer candidates and stuff like that. Uh, uh, as a platoon commander, I normally had two drill instructors working for me, with me. Mm -hmm. um, they did the hard work. And my job was to observe and, and uh, uh, from an officer's perspective, help judge the officer candidates. Their job was uh, disciplinary and motivational and uh, that that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, they were the ones that ran PT, they were the ones that did the you know drill instruction everything like that. Uh, I observed the training, I observed the officer candidates uh, you know, and at the end of the officer candidate class, toward the end, uh, it happened during the, the session. I had to call people in and say, "You're not making it at this point mm -hmm. in time, and and uh, this is what we're seeing, and this is what you need to approve and stuff like that." And uh, you know, the last week, I was the one that sat down with them and said, "You're not going to be commissioned," mm -hmm. and uh, for various reasons, and. Uh, you know, part of it was my trying to understand why they weren't making it, and uh, you know, one was my daddy. My daddy was an admiral, and he always liked having his marine sentries, and he thought it'd be great if his son was a marine. That's why you're here. 
Mm. You know, and what kind of numbers did you have then? What at this at this time were in that were there going the, through train that this training? The platoons. I can't say how many total there were, but uh, um, my platoon was about forty people. Okay. So and out of that forty. Several would get dropped on physical, medical conditions, and uh, then we'd always have three or four at the end that just didn't yeah. didn't stack up. Because the Vietnam War was winding. Vietnam down. War was winding down, but it's still mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then where'd you go from there? Um, I spent two and a half years there, and uh, uh, then transferred down to. Uh, uh, Camp Lejeune to the 2nd Marine Division, uh, got assigned to the uh, 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines, uh, company commander for Mike Company. Okay. Uh, again, a very different experience. Now, I've been away from the Fleet Marine Force for two and a half years, and uh, you know, taking over a company and having a very experienced first sergeant, very experienced gunnery sergeant, uh, staff sergeants, uh, but all re also recognizing at that point in time, um, again, this would have been 73, the war is winding down. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there were a lot of Marines in the Marine Corps that should not have been in the Marine Corps. And uh, we had a lot of those in in all of the companies that I had uh, at Camp Lejeune. And I, I started out with a rifle company. Uh, we probably had 140, 150 people where we should have had, by table of organization, about 200, 212, something like that. Um, but we, at any one time, we had five or six where we were working on discharges and uh, uh, unfit for service, uh, disciplinary issues. Um, if the disciplinary was bad enough, it was court martials, but uh, mm. it was a lot of minor stuff, uh, unfit for service, uh, people that we were working for, uh, uh, less than honorable discharges. When you said that this was um, a lot that had come in that Probably shouldn't have been in. Were were these some that were these young recruits that were that had signed up and had gone through like um, Paris Island and now they're coming up. Yeah, to they had you. gone through Paris Island. So and, they weren't people that were cut, that had. No, these experience. for the most part were people that uh, mm. gone through Paris Island and you wondered how uh, they brought one guy back from UA and uh, from unauthorized absence. Mm -hmm. And I'm. I have to do office hours on them, uh, uh, Article 15 and unit, uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice, and I can't understand his explanation or anything. Uh, Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. and I say Puerto Rican, U.S. Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rican who lived in, born in New York, and I finally called one of the clerks in who was also Puerto Rican. And I uh, said, Corporal Rivera, take this young man out and interview him, write down his story, and then we'll resume this. And uh, Corporal Rivera came back and said, uh, Sir, not only doesn't he speak good English, he doesn't speak good Spanish either. And, you know, we're quizzing the guy. He's telling me he joined the Marine Corps for two years. I said, What's this number here on your contract? That's a two. Was a four. Why did you join the Marine Corps? My girlfriend was pregnant. I was told that if I married her and joined the Marine Corps, she'd get medical care. You know, and the, the first morning he's in the barracks, somebody goes to wake him up. He doesn't want to get up, and they go to wake him up again. He pulls a pistol on him, and the pistol was an embarrassment. Uh, it was not a military pistol. It was corroded, cruddy, dirty. Hmm. You know, uh, but this person, we don't know how he got through the through recruiting. We don't know how he got through uh, 
the boot camp, I'm sure after a while I heard that his case went to the uh, Marine Corps what, Inspector what, what General language? for inspection and to, for an investigation as to how that mm. happened. What language did he speak? What was his native tongue? Bad, bad Puerto Rican. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, it's a whole different. We had a couple that were there that were part of McNamara's 100,000, if you're familiar with that program. Well, for people that aren't. Uh, 100,000 uh, young men who did not qualify for military service because of education, criminal offenses, etc., etc., mm -hmm. were drafted into the service. And. Uh, Definitely not the cream of American society. Okay. Um, if they were criminals outside the Marine Corps, typically they became criminals inside the Marine Corps. So, and every time I managed to get somebody discharged, the colonel would give me two more. <laughs> One of the two would end up going unauthorized absence, and the other we would mm -hmm. get through discharge. Reflecting back now, when you talk to other fellow Marines, did other people have similar experiences or was it just this period of time? Okay, I can delete all the way up, up until this part. Okay. Well, we just get back, we're still at camp, now we're at Camp Lejeune. You had asked if other officers had the same. I know in our battalion and so many other battalions at Camp, at camp Lejeune were having the same uh, issues and stuff like that. And I read a book uh, written by Anthony Zazzini uh, where he talked about, I think it was at Camp Pendleton, he com complained about the issues they were having disciplinary, racial, etc., 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 and why doesn't somebody do something about it? And he got called into the general's office and he said, you're in charge of making that happen. And uh, so I know, I know it was happening at Pendleton as well, so... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what, so what was the book again? It was written by Anthony Z uh, Zanini. Okay. Uh, and I can't remember the exact name of it, uh, but yeah, it was a it was not a good time for the core. That we had to deal with assaults in the barracks and fist fights and uh, a lot of disciplinary issues. Yeah, time of change. Yeah. So. So what was the high point of Camp Lejeune? The high point at that point in time, our battalion made, uh, we were assigned to uh, uh, the Caribbean Ready Force. And uh, the Marines at that time always had a, a battalion in the Mediterranean and a battalion in the Caribbean to react to local issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did uh, two deployments out of there. Uh, the first one, we participated in a uh, a combined arms uh, joint exercise, Air Force Navy. Uh, we did a landing at Camp Lejeune and like an, an assault while the 80, I forget which, wouldn't have been 80, 82nd at uh, Fort Bragg was doing an exercise, the Navy was doing an exercise, you know, so uh, we did that and then uh, after that uh, practice exercise and we uh, sailed down uh, uh, to uh, Vegas, Puerto Rico, uh, where we were on Vegas uh, training and stuff like that. That was a major training base. Now it's a tourist attraction, mm -hmm. um, tourist destination. It's east of uh, uh, Puerto Rico. Um, we stopped at uh, Guantanamo Bay because that was one of the places we might have to react to and spent several days at Guantanamo Bay and um, you know, other than being a thorn in the side of Castro at the time, we didn't see it, you know, uh, but uh, we would not have wanted to defend there. It would have been a little difficult, and 
high hill outside the perimeter where they could see everything going on in the base. So, uh, you know, but we did that. Then we went to Vegas, Puerto Rico for a while uh, doing that. Uh, we'd had a, uh, a stop at uh, Ponce, Puerto Rico for a weekend mm -hmm. and uh, some liberty and went on then to, uh, uh, you know, Vegas and back to Camp Lejeune. Um, I had met my wife in February uh, before we went on this first deployment, uh, dated the first time uh, in March. We left for uh, that deployment the end of March. We got back uh, middle of May, uh, got married in June. Where did y'all get married? At the Justice of the Peace in uh, <laughs> okay. Jacksonville, North Carolina. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, got married, uh, then in July uh, we did our second deployment. Uh, I met my wife actually at a battalion function, officers function, and uh, she would, came with a different company commander as his guest and, uh, you know, anyway. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if he feels the same way. <laughs> uh, but then we went on our second deployment out in July, another mm -hmm. six weeks, and there we went to the Panama Canal Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, jungle warfare training with the Army. Again, the Panama Canal was one of the places we would react to. Um, stopped again in, uh, uh, this time we stopped in uh, uh, Aruba, mm -hmm. or actually uh, Curacao, but in the ABC Islands in the Netherlands Antilles. And... Uh, I spent a couple of days there, and then we went on to Vegas again for the uh, more more training, tactical training. We trained with a uh, a unit of Dutch Marines, and uh, my company got to play the aggressor or the the bad guys, and uh, uh, Marines take the high ground, and all of a sudden we'd find the uh, Dutch Marines behind us again because they knew how to infiltrate around through the through the low areas without being um, seen, so. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. But we did that exercise, uh, then back to Lejeune. And uh, I guess it was September then, I believe, we got back in August and September, uh, I took over as company commander for headquarters and service company, uh, 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines. And again, uh, now this is a much bigger company, uh, but it was more of an administrative position, administrative office, because uh, uh, everybody in the company worked for somebody else. You know, you had the people that worked for the S1, S2, the different regimental offices, the supply officer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, had the armory. Uh, Mortar platoon. Uh, I forget what all else was in that, but again, it was a lot of administrative at that point in time. Uh, uh, doing some of the same stuff, doing different stuff. Uh, uh, being that everybody worked everywhere else, you mm -hmm. had to do a lot of coordination. So uh, very seldom did you see the company to commit the, together as a company. So was this, are you winding down now your time, or are you, what? At this, at this point, point in time, are you, are you yes. Yeah, so at this point, point in time, time I was looking at a career. Oh, okay. So you still work. I've had a couple of real good jobs at the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and some of the best jobs there are. Uh, platoon commander at Pendleton, a platoon commander uh, in Vietnam, uh, officer candidate school, staff NCO academy, company commander, uh, rifle company. Uh, you know, I, w I was thinking a career mm -hmm. was definitely a, a possibility. So I didn't know what I'd want to do in civilian life, so I was still looking at it as a career. So company commander, I think I was uh, company commander uh, about eight months, ten months, something like that. And then again, a, a, a rotation of officers as the battalion was getting ready to do the Mediterranean. and. Uh, 
I was assigned as the uh, battalion logistics officer, the S-4, and uh, uh, a job I totally disenjoyed. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was my my opening to what my future was if I stayed in the Marine Corps. And it was sitting behind a desk. It was not out with the troops. And uh, I just did not not like the that whole situation. And uh, uh, basically, having been married a little while, and uh, I decided that at that point that the Marine Corps and I had different priorities in life. That was your and, pivotal point then. Yeah, yeah, that was my pivotal point. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I normally wake up enjoying the challenges of going to work and waking up and dreading going to work was not uh, wasn't a good feeling mm -hmm. and uh, I decided that was the time to so I put in re my resignation um, and because the battalion was going to the med and I wasn't uh, I was transferred to the 2nd Motor Transport Battalion as a company commander and again, a company commander's job, and, and uh, again, I enjoyed working with the troops. Some of the same issues, uh, uh, getting into more, uh, you know, seeing the Marine Corps from a different perspective, from a uh, support perspective, trying to uh, hear all the duties, the assignments your company had for the, for the week, and how many trucks were needed there, how many trucks were, you mm -hmm. know, in truck maintenance and, and all of that uh, going on at that point in time. So I did that for six months. I had a, a battalion commander, uh, Colonel T.D., uh, who had just come back from embassy duty in, in uh, Moscow. Uh, really, really good leader. Um, he was there when I joined the battalion, uh, uh, yeah, the battalion. And when he first joined the battalion, he he went over to Force Troops Motor Transport, and he said he asked them, "I I need to borrow one of your most senior, experienced NCOs, motor transport background." And he put on his coveralls with this guy, and they climbed all over the trucks. And the guy ta taught him in a day or two everything there was to know about the trucks. Mm -hmm. And you would find Colonel Teedy <laughs> in coveralls under the trucks. <laughs> Talking to a Marine, why are you greasing that? Why does it need to be greased? What is this for? What is, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, really a good leader, very inspirational leader and stuff like that. But, uh, and the May came, my time was up and got discharged, mm -hmm. uh, headed back to Wisconsin. Was this, and then did, when you got, because you said you got married just to the peace, so when you go back, is this now you're bringing back your, your new bride and? Well, I actually, when I married her that June between the deployments, I took her back to Wisconsin okay. to meet my folks. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know anything was going on. I didn't tell them I was coming home. I drove in my wife with, with my wife into the uh, uh, under the farm by the by the house. There were a bunch of kids running around, and and one of the I guess it's nieces or nephews said, "Oh, it's Tony." And and he's got somebody with him, and I held up my you know my oh. hand and a wedding ring. Oh, and that's a beautiful ring. So at that point, I had to introduce my wife to my parents. So what was your wife's name? You haven't said her name. Betty. Betty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, where was Betty from? Because you met her at Camp. Lake she was born in North Carolina, okay. raised in Maryland, mm -hmm. and uh, um, then at, when I met her, she was working uh, at the commissary at Camp Lejeune. Okay. Alrighty. So we had we had every Friday bad together because uh, she worked at the commissary and Friday was when the DUA unauthorized absentees were returned to the base. So I got unauthorized absentees that I had to deal with that day. She got dependents that had to oh. get food and clothing and stuff like that. She did that part of her job. And so by the end of the day on Friday we were both kind of miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. So now, but now you're getting into, because I know you've done a whole ton of stuff in yep. your civilian life. So yeah. 
with your unless there's something you want to add on the military, but you get out and well, uh, driving out of Camp Lejeune, I said that phase of my life is over, and I tried to put it behind me. But you know, I thought about the Marine Corps many times, and um, when I got into my civilian life, I realized how much the Marine Corps prepared me. Um, I prepared my parents really prepared me for the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, the Marine Corps prepared me for the, the rest of my life. And, uh, um, you know, I thought about the Marine Corps, but uh, I had been offered the opportunity to take a reserve commission. I said, no, I'm, I was mm -hmm. out, out, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so I got out. After a couple of months, I found a job working for the state of Wisconsin in a field called industrial hygiene. Uh, noise, chemical, and other environmental hazards in the workplace. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the safety, which deals with injuries, we dealt primarily with prevention of illnesses. And uh, did six and a half years working for the state of Wisconsin on a consultation program. Companies would call us. We would go in and look and tell them what OSHA would find. Mm -hmm. okay. We didn't penalize or anything like that. So normally we were welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was doing that, uh, started looking for another job, looking for other opportunities. Uh, got uh, saw a job posted with a uh, Fortune 500 company there in Wisconsin. Um, I won't say the name because uh, I got a little bit of hard feelings, but uh, uh, worked. Uh, got the job with them as industrial hygiene in Wisconsin uh, for uh, four years and I was offered the opportunity to move down to Roswell, Georgia, a new position to do all safety and industrial hygiene. Hmm. So I, I took that opportunity. We moved down to, to Georgia in, uh, uh, in 82, 1982. So I took that job. I worked for that company uh, a total of 26 years. Uh, 2006, I got called into an office and was informed that my job had been eliminated. So uh, that's why I have hard feelings. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, went home and my wife said, why don't you go to Home Depot and get a bunch of nails and lumber? And that was my stress relief. So I went and pounded nails and stuff like that. And it took me a year to find a job. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found another job, and uh, this company uh, hired a lot of veterans, uh, senior veterans, a uh, lot of experience, uh, retirees. Um, they were hard jobs. They worked them hard. They, they did a lot of burnout. Not a lot of them mm -hmm. retired. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no retirement plan. Um, the, the bonuses were good. Mm -hmm. Uh, one year I got a bonus that was a quarter of my annual salary, along with a caveat that they already knew that the next two years weren't going to be that good, so don't, you know. Mm -hmm. don't get used, uh, don't but get all this time, again, doing uh, occupational safety and hygiene, walking into plants for the company, doing inspections. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the plants were not happy to see you because they viewed safety as uh, tattletales, going back mm -hmm. with bad stories to management and stuff like that. And um, I worked it from the perspective that when I was in the plant, I was working for the plant manager. I was there to make him a success. And that, that reputation got around. So uh, after a while, I was pretty well we uh, welcomed. And uh, my vice president, when I was retiring, called a number of plant managers and said, what tell me about Tony and their response, he summed it up as, he's a plant manager safety director. He's here to help us. And uh, so I did that till 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I had planned on five years, I stayed six. I was uh, 67 that year. I told the boss I didn't want to work full time anymore. Didn't mm -hmm. need to work full time anymore. Uh, part time was not an option. So I retired. Uh, they hired somebody else in to take the place. Uh, I did uh, five months of consulting with them after that on consulting contracts and stuff like that. And, um, so that was kind of my civilian career. 
Uh, Sounds like a good one. Uh, a lot of hard work. I made my paid for my career one day when I was out at a, a plant and an employee came up to me and said, Tony, thank you for saving my life. And I said, whoa, 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 I got to hear this story. I had been at the plant several months earlier and they said, what do we need, what can we do beyond what we're already doing? And I said, it's not required, but it would be a great safety improvement if your lift truck operators wore seat belts. And at that time, OSHA didn't require it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, it won't be like, but I said, it's... So she related that the company, the plant, implemented uh, seatbelt rule. And it wasn't liked at first, but she was driving a lift truck with the seatbelt on. She came around a corner and collided with another lift truck. They bounced apart and then bounced back together. And she said if she hadn't had that seat belt on, she'd have been between the lift trucks. Yeah. And I said, I just paid for my career. And uh, that's, right. that's one in the win column. Mm -hmm. You usually hear about the ones you lose, yeah. you know, not about yeah. the ones you... Yeah. You know, so... Uh, Hang on to that. I mean, that's yeah. good that, that she, she was able to tell you that. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that was my uh, civilian career. and, and uh, I'm going to guess uh, son Andy, uh, when he was in high school, started talking about going to Junior ROTC. And uh, we had four, four girls before the boy came along. And uh, two girls, the two oldest, Anna and Lisa, were adopted. They were my wife's by her first marriage. Mm -hmm. Daughters of a Marine. Uh, your wife's daughters of a Marine? Huh? Your wife's I mean, she was married to daughters of a Marine. Oh, yeah. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, then we had two girls together, and then the boy came along, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Andy was born in 81, and uh, so I guess it was about the time he was 15, 16, he wanted to join the Junior ROTC, Navy Junior ROTC, which was at Lassiter for the Pope Lassiter mm -hmm. uh, school system, and uh, we put him off for a couple of years. Uh, he wasn't that good a student. We said, you got to get your grades up. And we, we finally let him do that, but then, um, and I can't remember the major's name, but there was a Marine major who was the officer in charge of ROTC at Lassiter. And Andy really, really liked the guy. And so then Andy standing there one day saying, Dad, will you sign the papers for me, delayed enlistment for the Marine Corps? And that brought back a lot. Wow. Yeah, and uh, wow. because I knew in part what that meant, the great part what that meant. And I finally said to Andy, Andy, is it because you want to do it or because you think I want you to do it? It says, because if you think it's because I want you to do it, that's not the case. He said, no, he wanted to do it. So I signed the papers. Uh, he graduated uh, at the end of summer school. He wasn't a good student either. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, on delayed enlistment, went into uh, went to boot camp at Camp uh, uh, at Paris Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, he went to uh, Camp Lejeune for uh, um, infantry training. He wanted to be in the infantry. And then he went to... Uh, uh, the 7th Marines, 1st uh, Marine Division at uh, um, 29 Palms, California, Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, while he was out there, this is pulling me back into the Corps now. You know, and I start getting interested in, in the Marine Corps and stuff like that. And, uh, The, uh, one day I'm at the grocery store and a guy saw that I had a Marine Corps Semper Fi Fund sweatshirt, a shirt on. And he says, are you in the Marine Corps League? And I said, the what? You know, I, you know. So I joined the Marine Corps League. And again, brought me closer back to the Marine Corps and, and that. And, um, from Andy's career, uh, just to digress a little bit, uh, he was in Iraq for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, saw 
some crap. Uh, came back, got discharged. Marine Corps was calling around looking for people to come back on active duty for a year. He volunteered, knowing that he'd go back to Iraq for a year. He went to Iraq for a second year, a uh, second tour. It wasn't a full year. Then when he got discharged, he got his college degree. He went back in as a second lieutenant of the Marines. But he figured he had walked enough, so he went into tanks. Mm. Uh, mm. He ultimately uh, made captain, but... Uh, some of his combat experience, concussions, uh, he got medically discharged uh, as a captain of the Marines. So mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of his story. And he's doing real well now as oh, a good. realtor oh, in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. but picking up, joined the Marine Corps uh, League and started getting involved with that. And somehow or another, I found myself elected senior vice commandant. I was running against somebody else I thought was sure to be elected, and he dropped out at the last mm -hmm. minute. Uh, I became detachment commandant. Uh, uh, now I'm the, you know, junior past commandant, and uh, that's now I'm again back to senior vice commandant, and also working as the adjutant, so mm -hmm. uh, doing paperwork and stuff like that. So again, helping Marines, but the camaraderie of the Marine Corps. Uh, you know, pulled you back in. You don't find that any place else. Yeah. Because Andy was looking for that in civilian life, and I said the only place you might find that is in a fire department or a police department. You're not going to find it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had been to uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, for the Cooper River Bridge run walk one year, and I ran into this booth for the Semper Five Fund, and I gave a donation and got a shirt mm -hmm. that what I was wearing at the grocery store and uh, I got connected with a guy in uh, Marietta who uh, was soliciting money for the Semper Fi Fund from the Marine Corps League. So I helped him with a little fundraising that year and he invited me to join him in Washington DC for some festivities around. So I went, I went up for the day and mm -hmm. That was my introduction to the Semper Fi Fund, which later became Semper Fi in America's fund when they expanded to the uh, all veterans. Um, the following year, I signed up as part of the team. There were four people on the team, the Sons of Pacific Heroes. Okay. Two founders of the teams had fathers that served in the Pacific. One had been a platoon commander on Iwo Jima. Oh, wow. And one had led, uh, from Navy perspective, an assault wave ashore on Okinawa mm. and ended up spending the first night on the beach, which, uh, anyway, uh, Sons of Pacific Heroes. And then a third guy from, uh, uh, Dan Kirk is here in Marietta, Sean Kelly is in California, uh, Mike is up in Michigan, and myself, the four members of the team. So that year I joined them and I started as a fundraiser and we mm -hmm. went up to... Uh, uh, I think I did $5,000, I raised something like that, and uh, went up again to Washington, D.C., got more, saw what they were doing and got more motivated in it. Uh, uh, the 10K actually tried to run it, and uh, Dan is the cheerleader, and uh, Sean is the taskmaster mm -hmm. uh, on the run. <laughs> uh, next year, COVID. So they, uh, it got changed to virtual. So that year mm -hmm. I did the uh, virtual marathon, 26.2 miles. Good for walk. you. I can't run. Well, I can walk that they might far. Finish it, yeah. I can walk that far in eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I did the 10K also that year. The following year I did the marathon again, virtual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, damn long walk. And uh, uh, then last year I did the... Uh, um, uh, the 10K again in Washington, D.C. Um, so the second year I was fundraising, I think I did $10,000, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. My target in 2021 was, uh, 2022 was 10000 uh, I ended up being the top fundraiser uh, for the entire 
group that was fundraising through the marathon. Wow. And it was top top on a team. Sean normally was top on a team, mm -hmm. but uh, a local ring, uh, a local veterans charity that was def was going under uh, gave me a $37,000 donation. And uh, wow. You know, so big deal. So the team did uh, uh, over eighty thousand dollars last year, and, and so signed up again to do it again this year. But is your son involved? No, my all? son is not involved at this point in time. He will be at one point, but mm -hmm. it sounds uh, like you found your yeah. It sounds like you the, found the a real uh, Marine Corps League detachment I'm at is here in Marietta, the Lance Corporal Squire Skip Wells detachment. Skip was a local boy, grew up in uh, the area here, went to uh, Sprayberry High School, and was killed in Chattanooga member to Chattanooga 5, and uh, a number of members of our detachment knew him. Mm -hmm. um, also in there, somehow or other, when I was commandant, they said one of your, one of your tasks is to uh, be a member of the uh, Marine Corps Coordinating Council of Georgia. And this was a group founded by Marine Corps General Raymond Davis, won a Medal of Honor, not one was awarded, nobody wins, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> was awarded Medal of Honor in Korea, mm -hmm. uh, trying to coordinate all the Marine Corps related activities in Georgia. So it's retired Marines, uh, former Marines, I shouldn't say former, no longer active duty Marines, uh, the recruiters, the uh, officer selection officers, the uh, Dobbins Air Force Base, uh, Albany, uh, Company B, the uh, uh, recon Reserve, trying to coordinate what goes on with them. So I started with them and also it gets into fundraising because they do an annual golf tournament and uh, they help Marines, uh, primarily the Marines, but also they'll do Navy corpsmen who served at the Marines, uh, uh, assistance with medical housing, uh, clothing, cars. Uh, mm -hmm. They recently established a, a scholarship program with Kennesaw State University, uh, GAP Scholarship, uh, veterans in their senior year college who needed a little money to get over the hump. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, get involved with their golf tournament every year and and raising money. So That's great. Sounds so, like, like, like it's pulled it back in and now you're contributing back and it's a better different I think sometimes I'm world. doing more for the Marine Corps now than I did when I was in the Marine Corps. Well, it's because of that. I mean, you know, you're seeing it in a different light and, yeah. and that's a positive, that's what you do. I mean, the, uh, we're reminded at Marines that our enlistment contract or our commission expires, but our oath never expires. Mm -hmm. So once a Marine, always a Marine and uh, try to keep now contributing to the Marines, and I got a grandson who is now serving at uh, Connie Bay, Hawaii, and my wife and I oh, joke wow. about it. Uh, uh, I joined the Marines, went to Vietnam. My son joined the Marines. He did two tours in Iraq. Grandson joined the Marines, and he's in the arrow wing on Connie Bay, Hawaii. <laughs> in Hawaii, and uh, so. Uh, and your wife Betty, how many years now has you've been married? Uh, we're. So, Celebrating 50 in June. Congratulations. Con yeah. That could be a whole nother, we should interview her as a, someone's done 50 years with a Marine. <laughs> um, yeah. That yeah. might be that. Yeah. I'll put that on my list. That might not be official. There, there would be some very interesting discussions because especially Marine wives have a mm -hmm. hard time. Uh, it's I'm, not, a, I'm not kidding. No, I've had enough conversations. You know, I would very much like to do that. Especially when, you know, in turbulent times, one day your husband walks in the door and says, uh, you need to go home to your parents because I'm going overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm pregnant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good you know luck. And having, having Go raising children and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, it was just a challenge. Fortunately now they're much more connected and they're able to call home sometimes. So, mm -hmm. although I know when Andy was in Iraq, uh, after something bad happened, the cell phone service got locked out mm -hmm. until the notifications occurred. So, uh, yeah. 
when he was in Iraq and I heard about Marines being killed and, you know, my initial reaction was, please God, don't let it be Andy. And then I said, you know what you're saying? Let it be somebody else's kid. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. devastating. And you get yeah. back to God's will be done. And yeah, the tables are turned because now you're the one yeah. being yeah. the worried parent yeah. and yeah. all so. the, um, well, it, it's, there's been a lot of good that's come out of it, you know. Yeah. The Marines are something yeah. that cut from a different cloth, <laughs> they would say. But um, it's, and I say it's never the end because, as I've made clear with your story, thank you so much for sharing that um, it can be continued. Uh, that once once you get in with the Library of Congress, it's there forever. You don't have to do the paperwork that I've done yeah. all this time. It's always there. Um, same thing would be great to have your son who got out have another Gasper alongside another little interview to you need to compare. schedule at least half a day for that yeah if you well, think I talk a lot well there's a lot to say probably yeah but um, but I do like to let you have just take a just a minute but but because this is your story and it could be 50 years from now somebody listening what would something you want to end up on? Any reflection or a comment to somebody else considering the Marines, considering military, or or a thank you to the Marines? You know, how should we wrap this up? How would you like to wrap this up today? The being born to the two of the greatest people in the world, living in the greatest country in the world. Uh, luck and a draw. My parents prepared me the basics for life. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps prepared me for the rest of my life. And having met my wife at uh, Camp Lejeune, you know, I've had a very lucky in my mind life. Uh, joined a, re a Navy Reserve, led to a Marine Corps commission. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of experiences led me to my wife, uh, my children. Um, you know, it really, it really, the Marine Corps prepared me for the rest of my life. I didn't run into very many situations where I couldn't think back and my Marine Corps career hadn't prepared me for mm -hmm. developing an appropriate response. And, uh, that says it you know, it, it's not for everybody. Uh, my brother had called me and said uh, he was going to be in a, on the verge of being drafted. He was thinking of joining the Marines, and I said, join a service where you can get a, learn a trade. And he ended up getting drafted instead of volunteering and uh, got assigned to artillery and then to rockets and went to Germany, <laughs> which... Uh, uh, firing nuclear-tipped nuclear rockets, uh, not a big civilian career, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, um, you know, so it, it prepared me for, for most everything I've dealt with in the rest of my life. And, you know, the other part of that is for my fellow Marines and for the other servicemen as well, mm -hmm. your oath never ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's no. That, I mean, what I hear is a lot of gratitude, not taking anything for granted, and you're also playing it forward because you're now doing what we need to have happen. You know, the ones with the experience to turn around because there's a lot of other ones um, in a different trajectory. You know, yeah. so thank you very, very much, Tony. Yeah. Very okay. Interesting talking with you a whole. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to seeing the tapes. Ah, okay. <laughs> the tapes. Okay, you will get that. Well, we will wrap this up. Thank you very much, and we'll end this now. And I always keep my fingers crossed that everything goes okay. But okay. We'll end this. Here Thank you.